Thank you very much, everybody, for being here. There might be a few people still to come. Um, welcome. My name is Patricia Jennett, and people often ask me whether I'm Trish, Trisha. I don't mind either, and I don't even mind Patricia. I just don't respond to Pat. <laughs> and my little brother, who's now 50, still calls me P, so <laughs> don't ask about that one. Um, I'm privileged today to facilitate this plenary, and the aim is to further develop our conference theme, of course, of Raw Leap and Dare, within the context of the National Libraries and these amazing three people who lead them. I'm going to first acknowledge that uh, we meet um, on the land of the Agambe people of the Gold Coast, and I pay my personal respects to their leaders who may be current um, and are emerging, and leaders past as well. Now, before the panellists start, I'm just going to throw up a mystery slide which they haven't seen, and neither have you. So thank you very much, Connor. Mm -hmm. Here it is. It says, black coffee, green tea, Milo, or herbal tea. Now, there's four drinks there, and there's only three speakers. So it's a matching game. <laughs> During the presentation, you might get a bit of a gist and some personal details about these three leaders of their national libraries. You might be able to choose which is their drink of choice. You may not, and you may just have to make a guess. Please tweet it, and there's a bottle of passable red <laughs> for the first person who gets them right. Uh, don't forget to use hashtag applic18. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I don't think I need to do anything else. What I'm going to do is we're going to ask our speakers to give you first a bit of an explanation of who they are and what they do in a, in a brief moment. I've given them a very short five minute timeline and they have some slides to go with that. And then we're going to launch into a couple of questions that will tease out some of that. If you do have a burning question you'd like to ask, and we've got some time at the end, shoot your hand up and we do have some microphones, courtesy of Mel and the volunteers. Um, otherwise, feel free to interrupt, because we're all interruptible. Mm. So I'm going to start um, very politically sensitively with the person who's come the furthest. Oh, okay. <laughs> and that's Elaine, and she's going to explain to you her role at the National Library of Singapore. Okay, all right. Thank you very much, Patricia. Um, oops. Tricia. <laughs> uh, first, I have to confess, I'm not actually a national librarian um, because in Singapore, the National Library Board, we oversee the 26 public libraries of Singapore, as well as the National Library, the National Archives, and the Film Archive. So we're more like a, a big conglomerate, and I guess it's because we're a small country. But um, that, that just makes my job a lot more interesting. And um, I just wanted to quickly share that um, one of the things that um, I've been doing, uh, which I thought about it when Bill asked me this question. He asked me this question two nights ago about what was my first job uh, when I started work. Uh, and I had to confess that uh, although I was a literature graduate, I started work in a bank as a gold and futures dealer which is very apt for being in the Gold Coast, isn't it? Mm. Yes. But um, I was absolutely horrible at it, as you can imagine. There's no complexity in thinking whether to buy high, or, you know, buy low and sell high. Um, thankfully, I had a very nice employer and they made me a gold custodian. So I'm one of the few people who's actually seen a gold vault, you know, with, and there are indeed piles of gold just like Alibaba's. Okay, but um, I, I brought that up because libraries are like gold, you know, um, intrinsically valuable, very important, but, but sometimes we need to spend a lot of time getting people to recognize our value and advocacy is pretty big in the role that I have. So when, and, and one of the things that I try to do is um, to put our libraries in the national agenda. And in Singapore, the national agenda is about how we can become a smart nation, a digital government, and uh, the revamping of libraries in Singapore, as you can see from these pictures, includes a lot of, um, of, of digital initiatives. Um, and as Sue McCarricka likes to tell me, you need, you need some of the ribbon-cutting events, right? Yeah, so every, every time, you know, we spend a lot of um, 
effort trying to find occasions for community leaders and political leaders just to come um, cut the ribbon but to see our value and, um, and that's a, a very important thing. Another part that we've been doing um, to be part of the national agenda on smart nation is how can we introduce robotics and artificial intelligence in a library? And, and you know, when you do that, industry becomes interested. And industry comes and sees the library as a platform where, uh, for innovation. And I, one of my colleagues might have introduced this at um, her presentation, a shelf reading robot. The one that was here just before, um, that I showed before was an automated book drop. And, and this is a shelf reading robot, which again, we, we managed to pilot together with, with industry. Um, and I guess the other part of the national agenda that we, we like to be part of is really about bridging digital divides and, and digital readiness. And this is something both the National Library and the public libraries in Singapore work a great deal on with clinics, and with new technology workshops. And, um, and finally, which is very important for us as um, a country that focuses on future economies, to introduce new technologies to many of our patrons, artificial intelligence, robotics, cybersecurity, blockchain. I think all these have been uh, important for us to introduce. So just, just a quick run through about myself personally, and uh, how I got to the Gold Coast, from Gold Custodian to the Gold Coast, <laughs> yeah, and uh, a little bit about what the National Library Board's focused on. Thank you, Elaine. Elaine, how long have you been in your role? I've been in my role seven years. Okay. Yeah, seven years. Um, after I was uh, kicked out from banking, you know, <laughs> sheer ineptitude. Um, I, I moved into various policy roles in, in government before I went to the National Heritage Board where the, it's about museums and it's a, a sector that I love a great deal. Excellent, thank you. All right, the person who's grown second longest or come second furthest, I should say, Bill McNaught. Kia ora tato. Uh, I believe in the democratization of knowledge. I therefore believe in the value of libraries, and I've been a librarian for over 40 years. These are the various jobs that I've done in those 40 years. The first couple were in my hometown of Stirling in Scotland. Then I made a giant leap, it felt like it at the time, across the border to work in the north of England. <laughs> where I was information services librarian in Gateshead. I was attracted to that job by the innovative use of ICT for socially disadvantaged people. At the time, libraries were using ICT mainly for business information, and in Gateshead, we were using it for the whole population. For example, we worked with Tesco to provide a teleshopping and community information service in branch libraries and mining villages during the minor strike in 1984. So we were doing teleshopping probably long before the rest of the world kind of caught on. Fast forward to 1993 when I was director of libraries and arts in Gateshead and I led the project to commission Sir Anthony Gormley to build an angel. Um, the angel project was highly controversial it began in 1993 with me persuading the council that this 20 meter high sculpture would be good for our blue collar working class community. And to their credit, the politicians withstood five years of public criticism. And when the angel finally landed in 1998, public opinion changed immediately. Now the angel is iconic, not just for Gateshead, but for the UK as a whole. So I was quite tickled when the Financial Times put it on the front page after all the controversy that we had and criticism from uh, businesses while we were trying to create the sculpture. The angel was daring for the council and as a public servant, I was often reminded how brave it was for me to lead this project. But taken in context, 
the Angel was part of an ambitious plan to regenerate the old industrial landscape of Gateshead through cultural investment. The riverside in the CBD was desperately needing to be regenerated with 43 million pounds of Arts Council lottery money, we turned an old flour mill silo into the largest space for contemporary art in the UK outside of London. There you see the, the completed Baltic Centre for Contemporary Art. Just 400 metres along the river, we got £70 million to create a concert hall designed by Norman Foster. Those three projects, A for Angel, B for Baltic, C for Concert Hall, brought over £100 million of Arts Council lottery funding to transform the cultural infrastructure in a community of just 200,000 people. That's when I made a daring leap to New Zealand. My wife and I moved to Taranaki in 2005, and I quickly discovered that I knew nothing about the difficult history and legacy of the New Zealand wars between Māori and the Crown. I persuaded my team at Puke Ariki that we should create a five-year program of exhibitions to explore the 150-year-old history. Some people told me it was far too ambitious, but we succeeded in demonstrating that a library is a safe space for difficult discussions. In 2011, I became National Librarian. Following the global financial crisis, it was a challenging time for all public services, so it took us a few years to reach the point when we finally produced our strategic directions, looking out to 2030. In those strategic directions, we focus on three things, taonga, knowledge, and reading. Taonga is about our documentary heritage. Knowledge is about sharing more easily at system level across New Zealand. But reading is the one that I want to roar about today. We know that reading can bring all sorts of rewards from fun through to educational achievement and life-changing information. As citizens, you can access and read a vast amount of government information. Inspecting the public record is the right of every citizen in our democracy. But we know that almost half the adult population in New Zealand struggles with the written word. So it's as simple as this. Until we have a nation that can read well, then we don't have a really strong democracy. What happens when people cannot use trusted information? This is what keeps me awake at night, the erosion of trust in public information. Incidentally, I took this photograph of a new cocktail served in a bar in Wellington. It, each cocktail comes with a photograph and a quote from President Trump, and it involves some sort of orange liqueur. <laughs> <laughs> Libraries stand for open sharing of knowledge, trusted information, and collaboration at scale. Open trusted and united is the theme of New Zealand's bid to host IFLA in Auckland in 2020. I remember celebrating with our friends from Singapore when they hosted IFLA in 2013. Yes. Wouldn't it be splendid if we could all celebrate New Zealand bringing IFLA to Auckland in 2020? Yes. Kia ora. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. It doesn't sound like you've got too much time in your life, but seeing as reading is, is important to you, do you have something you've got on the go at the moment that you'd care to share? Um, Sorry, question on spec. Yeah, uh, well, the answer is um, yes. I've got um, a book in my bag that I'm about to start, and it's, mm, is it Firecrest? Um, I'd need to check my bag. I'll tell you in a minute. <laughs> Sounds good. Is it fiction? It is fiction. Excellent. That's what we like to hear. Ari Louise, you're on. Sure. Okay. So can I get the slides up? 
Uh, sorry, yes, we have a short break while the slides are coming yep. up for Mari Louise. Has anybody got any questions for either Elaine or there Bill? Go. Here we go. Yeah. Oh, here we go. That was quick. Thank okay, you. Okay, well, um, I'm going to go back one because um, and start here. Every day before I walk into this beautiful National Library of Australia building, which is 50 years old this month and stands on the land of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, I do this because for all of us, no matter how senior we are in our organisations, we have other lives and they nourish us and they allow us to be whole human beings at work. By the time I arrive at work, at my desk, I've exercised, talked to my husband, done chores and responded to up to a dozen emails. And then yes, I arrive at work and I have a desk and there's a huge volume of reading and writing to do and more emails and many meetings. These are not interruptions. These are my work because they are all tools that allow us to work in the present but to move along in a journey. But if you wonder what's different about a National Librarian's Day, then I think it's really the number and type of networks. So I want to introduce you to a few of those. And on any given day at work, I'm likely to be interacting with at least half a dozen of these networks. There's my minister, Senator Mitch Firefield. Maintaining an effective and continuing relationship with his office is essential. And that's the case even though I do not actually report to the minister. The library is a statutory agency and the library's council is our accountable authority and my most important working relationship is with the chair of the council. Um, and this here is our wonderful executive team with Ryan Stokes, who was our chair until just a month ago. I'm also accountable to parliament because we are responsible for proper expenditure of taxpayers' money. Being absolutely on top of one's brief is essential in any hearings before Parliament because you are testifying. Government money, taxpayer money, accounts for only part of our revenue and over the last 10 years our Foundation Board has helped us to raise funds for specific purposes. At the moment I spend maybe 5% of my time on this. Over the next year, the next few years, I expect to spend between 15 and 20% of my time fundraising rather than running the library. I also work frequently with the heads of the other Commonwealth cultural institutions, but not always at the Prime Minister's house. <laughs> And beyond these folk, there are colleagues in our portfolio department, gatherings of very senior public servants in open and closed scenarios. Then, of course, there are our powerful library networks, including uh, National and State Libraries Australia, colleagues with whom I met for two days in Brisbane just last week, and members of the Libraries Australia Advisory Committee, which provide us with the guidance we need to make policy and investment decisions around our shared infrastructure. And there is ALIA and the Australian Libraries Copyright Committee and the Australian Digital Alliance and research networks. I think you get the picture. There are other networks as well. One thing that really surprised me when I stepped and did this role was the amount of what I think of as ceremonial or ribbon cutting. Um, the visits from ambassadors, the dinners, the lunches, the social events at which one is the visible face of the library and what it means. Now, it's not all inward facing. I do indeed lead the library, whether that's working with others to explore and define our priorities or to communicate the power and the impact of what we do. And we do achieve so much for our communities. We hold more than 100 events a year at the library and I attend almost all of them. This is Canberra's annual Enlightened Festival, our fabulous kids disco, uh, a collection viewing, and gee, I wish I could do more of these now. This was a few years ago. And I love the community connections that come through our work, in this case around suffragette collections. And of course, the millions of people who use Trove to change and improve their lives and our understanding of our national stories. We contribute to book culture, including through book launches, in this case, our own children's book, Sorry Day. But, of course, our work can't be just about communities and networks we already serve well. So I put a lot of thought and effort into learning about our rich First Nations cultures, whether that is from visitors or from our own incredibly generous colleagues. 
And speaking of colleagues, if you're the National Librarian, you are the face of the library, but you know that there are hundreds of faces giving their all to serve our citizens. And it's always a pleasure to recognise that special work and also the everyday work that we do day in, day out, year in, year out, so that we can collect, connect with communities and collaborate, whether that's in Australia or in the case of our colleagues in the Jakarta office in Indonesia. Um, and of course, we're also aiming to serve communities that are very new or coming. And in this case, this is the 10 week old baby of one of our council members with his very first library card. Oh, um, so with 100, uh, 100 events a year, I get home at least late, at least twice and often three times a week. And by the time I get ready, I'm ready to give my brain and relax. And in fact, instead of thinking about roaring, leaping and daring, I'm thinking about how so much of our work is about knitting networks together, mm. about keeping things together, um, about not biting off a, a pattern that's too ambitious for you and mostly just knit one, pearl one, turn around, keep doing, knit one, pearl one and eventually you make something. And then, of course, after I knit a bit at night, the next day starts again. Thank you. Thank you. So we've got a little snippet from um, our three speakers. Now what we're going to do um, is actually squish questions two and three together, I'm giving you some, so we're going to explore the concept of raw, despite what Anne-Marie just said, and um, we're going to expand that. Um, and so the question that I put to the panel was, let's explore the raw. Can you provide a recent example of where you've had to be loud or to advocate for a group or a project or a process within your role. And I'm going to bring that together with that fact that being loud or advocating and even leaping requires bravery, I think, at a personal level. And we've spoken a little bit about that. And sometimes at a corporate level as well, as Bill mentioned. The audience would love to hear, I think, about a time when you have roared or leapt and been brave. So this is your opportunity. Elaine, do you want oh, to start? Yeah, I'll start <laughs> first again. Um, well, I, I've got um, something that I take quite, um, think quite passionately about, and it's about uh, finding opportunities in the libraries for persons with special needs to get full-time employment. And um, this is something that we embarked on because uh, we started working with the autism community in Singapore, and we started out with the problem of digitization and how do we get more people to do digitization for us and find that job meaningful. And um, we were having difficulty with, with uh, temporary staff and we, uh, there was this opportunity to work with the autism community in Singapore. And you know, in Singapore we have the challenge of providing a lot of special needs education for young persons, but when they leave that education, there aren't as many jobs that they could go to. And the area of digitization was something our National Library was looking at because we have so much to digitize and uh, we wanted to think about how we could frame that role um, as something persons with special needs could do. Um, I think that was new for us. Um, it's worked really well. We've had a lot of opportunities to, to provide work for, for persons with autism. We now hire 11 of them to do our digitization of our legal deposit collections. Um, and we give many opportunities for them to, to start out in the libraries as an opportunity to work and be familiar with society. And you know, the, the amazing thing we find working with people with special needs in our libraries that they, Sometimes they say the darnest things, you know. Um, we were having an event where we had a guest of honour and we had a young man with special needs and he kept looking at his watch, kept looking at his watch and my guest of honour looked at this young man and said, oh, um, are you looking at the time? Tell me what time it is, tell me what time it is. And this young man looked up at my guest and said, it's actually time for you to go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
was hilarious. <laughs> but it's been a meaningful journey, and, uh, and I think um, it's something we can think about, especially in our Singapore context, mm -hmm. how we can frame more of our jobs in the library area for, to give full-time and consistent employment to, to persons with special needs. So, so that's something that um, I say I've been doing a lot of roaring about. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Did, did you get any pushback from staff or members of the public about um, this new program? Yes, actually there were a lot of concerns originally, you know, and, and that's why I said we have to frame our jobs so that they can do it because typically we look at our jobs and say, oh look, um, if a person with special needs did this job and in this description, they wouldn't be able to do this part of the job or that part of the job. And so it required us to go back and, and rethink a lot of how we, we design our jobs so that it plays to their strengths. So in the case of persons with autism, because they were really focused, um, they don't want to go for lunch, we have to persuade them to go for lunch, they don't want to leave, and um, they wanted to do the same thing over and over again. And digitization work, you know, and doing meta tagging and checking really played to their strengths. And I think um, we're, we're pretty happy about that. Excellent, thank you. Bill, are we roaring? Um, well, as I said, I think the, the topic that I'm most keen to roar about these days is the whole subject of reading um, and how important it is. It's such a big challenge inside New Zealand government to help colleagues to understand the fundamental importance of creating that nation of readers because of course everybody who's got a job inside government is perfectly capable of reading all sorts of documents and when you talk about reading programs there is often this the whole point is that we're encouraging people to read because they'll actually enjoy it it's fun and of course spending public money on a program to give people fun doesn't like doesn't sound like the sort of thing that uh, New Zealand government should be spending taxpayer money on. So it's uh, increasingly there, there's just huge body of evidence about the benefits of getting, particularly getting preschool kids into that habit of having story times, building oracy skills, um, and increasingly it's about helping to present that evidence in a way that becomes incontrovertible and um, Later this year, I expect that we will be moving forward with much more of that united approach through um, getting everybody pulling in the same direction. I suppose over a number of years, there are so many organizations that are active in this space, but they tend to be doing their own thing and occasionally looking over the fence at what others are doing. Um, but the real strength of this is that if we all do actually work together uh, with mutually reinforcing activity, then I think we can make more of a breakthrough because, as I say, it's kind of self-evidently um, an important thing when you look at it, but it just doesn't seem, because decision makers kind of take it for granted that, well, what's stopping you reading? Um, it's getting that investment uh, at scale so that we tackle this chronic problem of too many kids not being able to read when, they, uh, when they're at school. In Australia, we have um, a NAPLAN um, federal uh, testing environment for primary school children. Is there something equivalent in New Zealand? Because we have a close the gap concept here. Um, well, there are testing environments. Um, and I was talking to Paul Heskett, our president of Lianza, about this just the other day. And the latest evidence would suggest that the situation is becoming worse. I'm right in saying, Paula, the situation is actually deteriorating in New Zealand. Historically, we have got a real divergence of some kids who are good at reading are very, very good when you look at the international comparators. But we've got such a large body of school children who are not sufficiently good with the written word. And it's that... Um, inequity that really needs tackling. Um, 
and it's, it's easy to say, well, that's the business of education, that's the business of school teachers, but when there's so much evidence pointing to the importance of early years activity in this space, I think it's such an important role for public libraries that they have been playing for 100 years or so, um, but too often not given credit for the importance of that work. And if I've heard it once, I've heard it 100 times, that in local councils, politicians tend to see the public library as a nice to have service. And my argument is that it's a critically important part of the social infrastructure that we need to build on and acknowledge the importance of that work. Good tweet. <laughs> so. Thank you, Bill. Marie Louise. Um, well, I'm going to be a little bit contrary and say that um, I'm not comfortable with raw because I think being loud very rarely achieves anything. Um, what works is persistence. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, um, you know, to affect change, you need persistence and persuasion, biting your tongue when yelling won't help. Um, and that often it means saying the same things over and over mm -hmm. again or writing them over and over again over years until eventually you hear others saying them and writing them and you know that you're in the right space. So I think that the example I would give from my recent career is around research infrastructure. Um, so Australia has a, uh, you know, a, a large um, a program that every 10 years or so there's a consideration of what research infrastructure is needed um, and funding is allocated. Uh, seven years ago, um, I started to go to every single forum that I could where researchers and data people were to start saying, what about the humanities and social sciences? And really to say to the humanists and social sciences, you are getting such a crap deal out of this. You know, you're really comfortable with all of that money over there funding what scientists need and nothing coming your way for for what you need. So I needed to be firm, but it wasn't loud, it was just repeated. The aim was to get the needs of humanities and social sciences onto the next research infrastructure roadmap, and we achieved that. It's one of the nine areas and is now seen as essential. Now, I guess the blow came then when the funding decisions came out, and there was funding allocated to humanities and social sciences, but almost all of it was for a building for the CSIRO to house its natural history collections. So it wasn't HASS at all. And that is, I think there's a few people in the room who will know that was one of the bitterest moments of my career. But you've got to pick yourself up and keep going. So you need to think, what's the most effective way to respond to that? In this case, it was most effective to respond through NASLA, not as the National Library. There needed to be a distinction there. Um, it was important to keep saying what the problem was. It was important, and I have said, and I've told my minister, we will do no unfunded work for the research sector. None. That's the deal. No funding there, no funding here either. So you need to be clear, but not loud. And I think you do find that things work. Just last night, I got home, there was an email from the Department of Education asking me to a forum later this month, a small forum, to say, how do we move forward with a scoping study to figure out what the human, humanists and social sciences actually need? Now, I'm a born optimist, but I think probably the best that we can hope for is that maybe in the next funding round in about five years' time, there might be some funding to address what I see as a very serious problem. Huge content held in our cultural institutions separated from the researchers in universities. So the problem still exists. So I guess I would just say um, roaring very rarely. I think in my career I've thrown one full-blown tantrum and if Monica Shaneko is in the room, she knows that not only did I have to do this over an international line, but I had to do it twice because the line dropped out. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think think about persuasion, persistence, clarity, um, message over and over again, and never ever think that it's important for um, you to take credit for the idea. If somebody else takes your idea and they can make it work, you've succeeded. So that's my take on it. Excellent. Thank you very much. 
Good. Yes. <laughs> right. Our time is almost complete. We're going to squeeze a little bit more out of um, the last question. So the, the last question for the panel was about trends. So we wanted to look to the future a little bit, um, even though Dave Snowden said that we weren't to do that too much. Mm. Um, but I think it is important, and I'm sure it's something that in your role. So what trends are you watching with interest and perhaps with trepidation? Um, about the impact it might have on your national institutions. Um, we're going to have to keep it brief, but thank you very much. Mary Louise, perhaps if you start. I'm going to say it's around um, national thinking around public goods and how we sustain them, that um, we have an increasing trend to um, a smaller tax base and therefore smaller um, whole of community investment in public goods like a national library and increasing um, desire or demand for private sector to step, step into the breach. Okay. And not just about the library, I find that a concern across so many of our public good areas. Because it has to be managed differently? It has to be managed differently, it needs different skills, um, and uh, you know, public funding can be used for the very long-term things where it doesn't have to be sexy. Yep. A whole lot harder to do that with private funding. Yes, mm. yep. okay, thank you. Bill. So Lucy Bloom said in her talk that we should focus. So I will stick with my focus about the importance of reading. Um, I'm slightly worried about the number of intelligent people that I talk to who think that um, because we're moving into an age where, for example, YouTube is such a popular way for people to find out information, that somehow the written word will, will become less important yeah. and you can get all the information you need without being able to read. That really worries me and I think it's our job to be relentless in our argument about the fundamental importance of reading well. Libraries are right in the best space to be making that case and supporting that activity in every community in our countries. Thank you, Elaine. Um, I'm very preoccupied about um, the, the impact of technology on societies and uh, the escalating take-up rates of, of technology, um, the way technology creates a lot of shifts in the way people read, the way people access information, the way people um, understand things. And um, as I shared in my early slides, um, it, it's important in this environment that um, the library is not seen as marginal in that whole technology shift. As societies take on technologies, libraries have to be a player and a shaper in, in this area. And, and that has a lot of implications for us because um, uh, it's also about how library information manages big data. You know, how, how do we as a as professionals um, use big data, how is big data uh, something that informs our decisions? And I, I think it's something that preoccupies me a lot because I see my own country and society move on in areas of um, technology take up. And it's really important for me that um, the National Library Board is part and parcel. It's not just part and parcel actually, it's in the leadership is in the forefront so that we're not marginalized and we're not seen as um, less and less relevant in the years ahead. I think for, for me, being seen as an innovation entity, as a player for innovation in our society is very important because it entrenches our uh, importance in, in both the economic and knowledge field and, and as I said earlier, in our national agenda. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. A.V. Man, could we have that original slide up, please, with the coffee and tea? <laughs> it, we've come to an end. It's been a lovely time. I want you to say thank you very much to these three wonderful people. Give them a big clap. But I don't want you to just clap them. I want to make sure that you support them. They are doing big jobs. Um, so make sure that you tell them that whenever you see them. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you to Oxford University Press for sponsoring this session. Thank you. Thank you.